All right, so just want to welcome everybody in person and also online. And um, just, just I, I am really very excited about the message today. So I, I do believe it is a one of those things that is coming out of the heart of God. You know, just you wait on the Lord. There's some messages you, it's like you chisel out a stone to get, and some just the Lord just downloads to you. I, I just feel like this is one of those messages that are, is really from the Lord's heart. And so I'm going to be talking about today the end time ministry of John. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to uh, John chapter 21, verse 22. And, uh, you know, we've been focused here, you know, starting in uh, as we entered into a new year. I, I, like I said last, last Sunday, is I always like to ask the Lord. I don't like to ask the Lord, Lord, what are you, what are you saying about 2022 because then it gets into like predictions and like God's going to do this and God's going to do this. And this is, a, you know, it, gets, it can get really weird. And a lot of times I've found a lot of those things never happen anyway. If you've been in the prophetic for a while, you realize, okay, not many of those things really come to pass anyway. I like to ask the Lord, Lord, as we're heading into 2022, Lord, what is the Spirit saying to the church? And it's a different way of saying it's not making predictions of what's going to happen in 2022. I'm not saying that never happens. It does. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, Lord, okay, we're heading into 2022. What is the Spirit of God saying to the church? And so Dad spoke a message that I thought was so great about fear God and no one else. And then I spoke about the, the transfiguration of Jesus, about being unshakable as we head into 2022, that God wants us to be unshakable. And so this message is about the, uh, along the same line of th the, the same theme is, Lord, what are you speaking in 2022? This is the end time ministry of John. So and this is, this is going to come from John chapter 21, verse 22. Let me turn there here. And uh, just to give you a little background of how this message came about, um, in December we were in a leaders meeting and we were eating, eating lunch or eating dinner with a, a group of leaders and um, the Lord just gave me out of nowhere this prophetic word for a pastor and the word was, I feel like God is going to really emphasize to you the ministry of John the Apostle. And the Lord wants to, you to focus on the ministry of John the Apostle. Uh, he is the beloved, he is the intimate, he is the lover, and he is the revelator. And that, that is something God wants to do in the end time church. He really wants to emphasize to the end time church the ministry of John. And so this, this word really encouraged this leader and in fact, he said they had actually had a couple of weeks ago a really renowned prophetic leader who shared along the very same lines as that. And so it was encouraging to me, it was encouraging to him, really just the Lord, the Lord spoke. And I, I felt like the Lord was saying when I was finished sharing that, that's not just for him, that's for you, that's for this church, and it's for the body of Christ, the end time ministry of, of John. And so anyway... Um, so in John chapter 21, verses 22, you probably have read this before, but it's one of those weird things that Peter, the Lord tells Peter, the Lord tells Peter, Peter, this is how you're going to die. I mean, how many want that kind of prophetic word given to him by Jesus? I, I, would, I, would, I, I much rather would not know how I'm going to die and just die than know, okay, this is how you're going to die. But the Lord tells Peter, you're going to die where, you know, in this, in this way, and, the, and then the Peter goes, okay, well, what about him? Lord, what about John? And the Lord says to him, he says to Peter, and I, I love Peter. You know, we talked about him last week. Peter just never knows when to, to shut up. He never knows when to be quiet. Some of us are like that. But John all, or Peter is always blurting out, Lord, what about this? What about that? And the Lord's like, Peter, Peter. Be quiet. And you know, last week, he, the father overshadows him and said, this is my beloved son. Well, this week, the Lord's like, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? And so then, you know, there's a, there's a lot of opinions about what that means. And I'm not going to get into all those different opinions in this message. But I want to focus on what I think one of the meanings is, is that the Lord wants to highlight the ministry of of the Apostle John to the end time church because John is a model that the Lord wants us to model our lives upon. And so here Jesus says, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? And so 
As we head into 2022, I, I believe the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is highlighting to the end time church the ministry of John. And so as I was thinking about this during worship, I really, if you've ever spoken, you know kind of what I'm going to say is you sometimes feel like, okay, what God gives you and your ability to articulate it are so different. Like you just feel your own human limitations of expressing what God wants you to speak. You know, if you ever like, you, you've ever felt God's love and you're overwhelmed with God's love and you're bawling and tearing and, and basically like, what did the Lord say to you? Jesus loves me. And you're like, yeah, I learned about that when I was three. And you know, it's like, no, I mean, he loves me. And you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. And so this is kind of the way I feel in trying to deliver this message is like, this is so rich and so beautiful from the heart of God, but I realize my own human limitations as a messenger. Um, and maybe I'll just ask, Lord, take me out of the way and let us hear the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church in this. So Lord, I, I'll just pray that. Lord, I ask you to take the human vessel out of the way, this earthen vessel out of the way with the limitations I have in communicating the revelation of God that we might truly have that treasure, that treasure in earthen, this earthen vessel would be communicated of your heart for the end time church. Amen. So before the Lord returns, the Holy Spirit, I believe, based on this scripture, if I want him to remain until I come, and again, again, there's other meanings to it, but I believe one of the meanings of this is the Holy Spirit wants to highlight to the end time church the Apostle John because John embodied, I would say John and Paul both kind of embodied this of, of what it was. But I, I think maybe John even more so than Paul in terms of the beloved one. Um, that, that John embodies this and the Lord would highlight the Apostle John to the end time church and say, model your life after him. The ministry of John, the, the, I believe the Spirit of God is wanting to emphasize the ministry of John to the end time church. And what do I mean by that? There's four different areas I believe the Lord wants to highlight. And the first one is John the Beloved. And I'm going to get into these in a much deeper way, but just quickly summarize. John the Beloved, he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. I, I love that about him. I'm going to drill into that in a minute, but he was the, he was, he knew God's love for him personally and deeply and intimately in a real way. And then there's also John the intimate, John the, the intimate one who not only knew the love of, of Jesus for him, but he was also the one, and he wrote this as, I, as if he's bragging, I lean my head against his chest. I love that about him. He was, he was proud about that, and I think the Lord was proud. I think the Lord loved that about John, that he wrote that. He's the one who leaned his head against the, the chest of Jesus to hear the heartbeat of Jesus. He was the intimate one. He's the one who wrote about the abiding life. He's the one who had intimacy with Christ. I'm going to get into a lot of that in a minute. Then there's John the lover. John the lover, the one who loved God. He loved God with passion. He loved God with a fervent passion and zeal and desire. And he also loved one another. And he loved others with the love of God he experienced. And he wrote about that in 1 John. Uh, he devoted almost his entire epistle about loving one another, the, the commandment of Jesus to love one another. And then there's John the revelator. John the one who had deep prophetic insight and deep Understanding the greatest insight and revelation ever given to a human person, a human man or woman was given to John. John the Revelator. John was caught up on the Isle of Patmos, and God revealed to him those things that are about to take place. John knew and saw more than any other person in history combined, I believe. Maybe not combined, but any other person in history greater than in any of the Old Testament prophets, John saw these things at the throne room of God. And so the Lord wants to highlight to us the ministry of John. So let's go into this. Let's go into this deep. Number one is John the Beloved. We're going to talk about John the Beloved. And, and so John was writing five times in his Gospels. I, I love what John did. 
Five times in his Gospels, John wrote, the, you know, it's his own Gospel, but he said, the disciple whom Jesus loved. I love that. I love that about John because he was so confident in God's love. He was so uh, convinced that God loved him in a real deep personal way. His entire identity was wrapped and shaped by the love of God. It was not by, by him being named an apostle or him doing great power ministry that his identity was formed in. It was not about what he did to build the kingdom or all his great exploits or whatever it was or his epistles or whatever it was. John's identity was found in the one that Jesus loved. And he said it five times in his gospels. That was his identity. And you think about like the church today. You think about the world today. And everyone is in search of their identity and they're trying to find their identity and their value in what they do or who they are or the way they look or how much money they make or all their possessions or who they know or their career, their ministry, their accomplishments, who likes their social media posts and who shares them and who views them on YouTube and how many people read their books or whatever. All of us, don't we, do that. We try to find our identity in what we do and how we look and how much money we have and this or that. But John was one who found his identity in being the beloved of Jesus. I want to be that way. I don't want to find my identity in what I do. I don't want to find my identity in, you know, and I'm a, I work, live on a pastor's salary, so in, in how much money I make. That would, I would be low self-esteem. So, you know, it's like, I'm kidding a little bit, but, you know, I don't want to find it in what I do. I don't want to find it in how much money I make or what my career is or whatever. I don't want to find it in any of that stuff that the world tries to find their identity in. I want to find my identity like John as being one who is the beloved of Jesus. You are the disciple that Jesus loves. To say that about yourself, I am the disciple who Jesus loves. Let that be what shapes your core identity and what establishes your value and your worth. Your value and your worth is not revolve around what you do, even what you do for God. Even in the church, we look at, you look at ministries and they're meant there. So many ministers find their identity in their ministry what they do for God, how many people they share the gospel with, how many people they baptize, how many people read their books, how many people listen to their worship music, whatever. I want to find my identity in loving God and being loved by God. John the Beloved was loved by God. See, the Lord wants to draw us into this deeply intimate personal relationship. And even though there is this dynamic of the corporate bride where we're fit together as living stones and we are the bride of Christ corporately, there's also a unique dynamic to it. In fact, when Jesus was talking to one of the seven churches, he says, if you, I think it was the church of, uh, of uh, Pergamos, he said, if you overcome, I will give you a white stone and a name written on that stone that no one knows who but the one who receives it. In other words, when you stand before the Lord... The Lord is going to give his bride a white stone. This is unique to every single one of us. And that stone is going to have a new name written on it. My stone will not be the same as dad's stone. I think mine's going to be better, but that's just, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I, I, I think dad's far surpassed me. So, so I'm striving to be like dad. So, but anyway, my stone and his name, his name and my name are going to be different. Your name and my name are going to be different. What I'm saying is, the uniqueness of your relationship with Jesus. That's established in the secret place with him. John was known to Jesus as the disciple whom he loved. John was known as the one, he wrote in his gospel, the disciple whom he loved, who leaned his head on his chest. That's what he wrote. I love that. I am the disciple whom Jesus loves who leaned his head on his chest. 
So many people are bragging about what they do for God. Well, we had this many people get baptized. We did this many signs and wonders, and these many people were healed. John's like, yeah, I don't get into all that. I am the disciple whom Jesus loves, and I am the one who leaned his head on his chest, my head on his chest. That's my identity. Now, yeah, I'll do the signs and wonders. I'll build the kingdom, and yeah, I'll write books that actually make it into the canonized version of the Bible. All of that will happen, yes, but I know there's something greater about my identity, and that is I am loved by God and I am intimate with him. That's where God wants to establish our identity. So at the judgment seat, you, the Lord is going to give you a white stone with you, a unique name on that stone. No one else in heaven is going to know the name on that stone except you and the Lord. It's that uniquely personal relationship you had with him in the secret place. And so I want to ask you, do you know what the Lord says to you that's unique about you? John did. John knew, I am the one whom Jesus loves. Take some time and ask the Lord, okay, Lord, what is my new name? Now, probably... In all reality, we're not going to know until we stand before him. But I believe the Lord will give you hints of that even in your time with him. Lord, what are you saying about me? What, what are you saying to me? What, who am I to you? Lord, what is, how do you view me? How do you view me in our relationship? So ask the Lord to do that. I, I like what Mike Bickle likes to say a lot. He says, I am loved by God and I love God, therefore I am successful. This is what determines our personal worth and value. I am loved by God and I am, I am a lover of God. That is what makes me successful. Love is what makes me successful. Not anything I do, not anything I accomplish, not how much money I have or how I look or how many people like what I post on social media or Twitter or whatever. What defines my value and worth is I am loved by God and I'm a lover of God. That determines my success. See, if we can get rooted and grounded in that reality, it will save us so many heartaches of striving to be significant to, in, the, in our own eyes and even in the eyes of the world, finding our self-esteem, our self-worth our self-value in what we have, what we don't have, how we look, what we do, who we know, our influence, our lack of influence, whatever, that we would, we would be rooted and grounded so deep in the love of God as his beloved, as his intimate, that it would shape and define and cause us to be who God calls us to be. See, God wants us to be rooted in his love, grounded in his love. Turn to, uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 37, verse 11. It's a scripture I believe the Lord highlighted to me when, and I think mom prayed it, that's probably why it was highlighted to me, but um, it was highlighted to me of, of what the Lord wants to do in the church, in the remnant of his church. Isaiah 37, verse 11 Maybe not verse 11. Isaiah 37. I wrote it down wrong. Uh, Isaiah, it's in Isaiah 37. I'm just going to summarize it. But it's in Isaiah 37 that, that the remnant, the remnant must, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the remnant must put their roots down deep and then bear fruit outward. The remnant must put their roots down deep and then bear fruit outward. So the Lord, as it relates to this message, God wants our roots to go deep in the love of God, deep in this revelation that I am loved by God, that God desires me. God calls me his beloved. God calls me his friend. God calls me his intimate one. God, the Lord Jesus is in love with me. The Lord Jesus is pursuing me. He loves me. He is after my heart. And I'm going to put my roots down so deep into that soil of God's love. And therefore, I'm going to bear fruit outwardly that comes from that being planted in. See, the fruit that comes out of our life is a direct result of our root system. If our root system is rooted in rejection, 
If our root system is rooted in rejection, rejection from what people have said to us, rejection from our parents, rejection from this, you know, someone we love. It could be a million different things. We can, you know, rejection even in the things of God, rejection in ministry. We can experience rejection in, in so many ways. When we have been rooted in rejection, and whether it's through abandonment or or hurt, or abuse, or whatever, when we're rejected and our root systems go down into that root, that soil of rejection, the fruit that is produced from our lives comes out of that rejection. It'll be, uh, it'll be fruit of criticism, fruit of judgment, fruit of rejecting others so that we're not being rejected, fruit of being contained within our own selves so that we're introverted so people can't reject us. It'll be a million different things that we do as a, as a uh, self-defense mechanism to guard us from being rejected again. So the root of rejection, God wants to take the church out of the root of rejection, transplant us from the root of rejection and plant us into the soil of God's love that we would be rooted and grounded in God's love so that therefore the fruit we produce comes out of God's love. That, that no matter if people reject us, people are always going to reject us. People who have a spirit of rejection on them are going to reject you. People that hurt are going to hurt you. But what we, God wants us to do is to, uh, he wants to root us in that love of God so that our root system goes down deep in his love for us, which Paul said in, in Ephesians chapter 3, it's the height, the length, the width, the depth of the love of God. It surpasses knowledge that no matter what happens to us, that it just doesn't matter what they say because I'm loved by God. It doesn't matter what they say because I am loved by God. I am the beloved of, of the Son of God. Therefore, the rejection doesn't sting. The rejection doesn't lodge. The rejection doesn't stick. I am not transplant. I am not planted any longer in the soil of rejection. I am now planted in the soil of God's love, and my root system flows out of his love, so the fruit I produce is coming out of love. And that's what we see in John the Beloved. He, he was rooted and grounded in the love of God. I am the disciple who he loves. And so God wants to highlight to the end time church, this one John knew the love of God. John is the one who wrote down in, in his gospels, he says, I'm paraphrasing it, but he says, he says, in the same way the Father loves Jesus, he loves you. That is remarkable if you've studied the way God the Father loves Jesus. Not only that, but John said, the way the Father loves Jesus, Jesus loves you. The Father and the Son love us just like they love God. What could be any better than that? To be loved by the ultimate lover of the universe that it, it just surpasses knowledge. That's why Paul was praying for the Ephesians, that they might know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you might be filled up with all the fullness of God. I don't think we can be filled up with the fullness of God without being filled with the love of God. Because God is love. And if we're not walking in that love, then that means we're not filled with God. If we don't know, if we say that we know God and we don't love, then that John's like, you don't know God because God is love. And so God, um, the Lord wants us to go so deep into the Father's love for us, which is, which is exactly like he loves Jesus, and so deep in the Son's love for us, which is exactly like the Father loves Jesus, and that we would experience that love so that we might be filled with all the fullness of God and therefore being rooted and grounded in the love of God, the fruit that comes out of us organically is the fruit of love. See, the Lord is so different than we think. 
You know, we think the Lord is going... Now, there are, there are definitely times when God speaks directly into our situation and says, you need to repent of this sin. You need to repent of what you're doing. You need to, re like he's, you know, read the churches in the book of Revelation. He's not mincing words with them. But there's also a side to Jesus that he looks at us and he speaks into our budding virtues and he says, I see the spirit of God in you. Therefore, even though you're struggling in this area, I say you are a rock, Peter. And he looks at Abraham, who's barren, and he says, you are a father of many nations. God calls those things that are not as though they were because he sees who it is who dwells inside of you. God speaks to you according to your budding virtues and says, this is who you are. See, so much of the time when we're look, talking about someone, myself included, we talk about their limitations and their, their, their whatever, their personality issues or whatever it would be, and we don't see, okay, no, who are they based on God's love? Who are they rooted in God's love? See, see love believes the best about people. We usually believe the worst. When we're judging and criticizing people, it's impossible to love them. When we're judging people and we're criticizing people, it's impossible to love them. That's why the Lord's like, get the log out of your own eye and you will be able to love with my love. That does not mean we don't have discernment. That does not mean we don't discern things spiritually that's going on. But God wants us to move out of this fleshly, carnal, religious judgment that automatically says this person's in this category, this person's in that category, and we criticize them, and we accuse them of this or that, and the Lord's like, no, love with my love. Believe the best about people and let them convince you otherwise. Discern, discernment doesn't mean we list out all their faults. Discernment means we abound in love, and then as we abound in love in our discernment, then we can see, okay, they're struggling in this area. I'm going to pray for them motivated by love. See, do we really know the love of God for us? I want to encourage you. Song of Solomon, I think it's 1 verse 2 says, the bride says, kiss me with the kisses of your mouth because your love is better than wine. Now, that does not mean, don't envision like a bearded man coming up to you and kissing you on the lips, okay? This is not anything physical. Uh, not, not many guys... Not many guys would actually want a bearded man to kiss you on the lips. Not many women probably would. I don't know. I'm going to stop right there. But point, point said, this is not physical. It's spiritual. This prayer in the Song of Solomon is that we would know in a personal way. See, what I'm telling you right now is just, it's just theology. It's just truth. It's just facts. It's just, I mean, it's revelation. But unless it gets to you in an experiential, personal way, it doesn't affect you. It doesn't get into you. It doesn't change you. It doesn't transform you. That's why we, we, we need to pray, Lord, let, you know, whether, you know, you, if you're a guy, you may not want to say, Lord, kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. You might want to just say, Lord, let me know in a personal way your unique love for me that I could experience the length and width and height and depth of your love and be rooted and grounded in your love. See, we've got to know the love of Jesus Christ. We've got to know the love of Jesus Christ. His boundless affection for you in a personal way, especially as we head into the end times in a greater, deeper way, as things around us are shaking, as, as the world gets offended, as rejection goes to new levels, as offense increases. We've got to be rooted and grounded no matter what people say about us no matter what people think about us, in the love of Jesus Christ. That has to be our identity. Your homework assignment is to get along with the Lord and ask Him to reveal to you the way He feels about you 
and ask him to speak to you your unique names. That's your homework assignment. Just, Lord, what do you think about me? How do you see me? Let me feel your love. And Lord, what, how do you name me? And, and the Lord, now, now the Lord might rebuke you and he might say, correct this or that. So, but he will also, he'll speak into your potential because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And he will let you know how much he loves you. The second thing that John the Apostle models for us is he's the intimate one. Again, I mentioned this, but he was the one leaning on, I love this, it's John 20, verse 21, verse 20. He said, you know, he's writing his own gospels. This would be like me in the eternal blueprint saying, I am Brian Kessler, the one Jesus loves, and I lean my head against his chest. I mean, a lot of people reading that would go, that's kind of arrogant, that's kind of weird. But, you know, that, that was in the scriptures because I think God loves that. I think God loves that. He's like, I like that boast you have, John. In fact, Jeremiah says, let him who boasts, boast in this, that he knows and understands me. That, that our boast comes out of the fact that we know Christ. That's our boast. That's a boast that pleases God. It's not a boast that leads to arrogance. That is a boast that pleases God. I am, a, I am loved by God. I am his intimate one. See, if you think about John, all he wrote about, just, just studying the life of John, John wrote about the indwelling spirit, the abiding life which Drew sang about in worship, John 15. You think about the abiding life in John 15, there, there may have never been another expression of intimacy quite like the abiding life that Jesus talked about in John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me will bear much fruit. I mean, the depth of that, that scripture is just mind-blowing that we can't produce anything of value for God apart from his life, his indwelling life, organically flowing out of us outward. In fact, let's turn to John 15 here. Just so we're, we see it, that John 15 is, uh, John, John is the one, the Lord, even though, even though the, the, Lord, all, the other disciples wrote it, it was only John, it was almost like the Lord said, no, this one is going to be written by John. Because John lives this life. John, the intimate one. John, John, uh, John 15, 1, the Lord said, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. And he goes through and says, you are the branches. And, and down a little bit further. I am the vine, you are the branches. In other words, what the Lord's getting at here is this. He's not talking about at that given time because he was speaking about the time when the spirit of Jesus would come and would come into those who've been born of the spirit. And, he, and, and Jesus, John is actually recording about intimacy that, that there's coming a time when you would be born again, when your, your, your human spirit and the Spirit of God, the indwelling Holy Spirit would come in and he would make your human spirit and his spirit one. That union, that spiritual union where the, the indestructible life of God is now inside of you, in that spiritual union of life, the life of God would flow from him into your spirit, from your spirit into your heart, from your heart outward into your soul, and then from your soul outward into your body, bearing the fruit of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said there was fruit, much fruit, more abundant fruit and fruit that remains. That comes from like God's indwelling life, the Holy Spirit is like the sap that runs through the branch that produces that life. See, you are already connected spirit to spirit to Jesus Christ if you've been born again. The problem is you either don't know it or you allow your flesh or your soul to be stronger than your spirit 
and it suppresses that life in you preventing fruit. But what is, what is um, whatever part of you is the strongest will be the part of you that leads. If your, flesh is, if your flesh is the strongest, your flesh will lead and, your, and life will be suppressed in you. If your soul is strongest, your analytical mind, your emotions, your will is the strongest, that means your soul will lead. But if your spirit is the strongest, if, if God the Holy Spirit is strengthening your spirit, if your spirit is the strongest, that then means your spirit will lead and the life of God, that organic life, the indestructible life of God will flow out of you into intimacy. I am the vine, you are the branches. John was the one who, who wrote about that because he lived it in his, in his life on earth with Christ. John is the one who wrote about the Lord inviting us to dine with him. John is the one who wrote about the coming of the indwelling spirit. John is the one who wrote about return to your first love. And he wrote so much of this about this abiding intimate life, abiding in the love of Christ, living from this place of, of, of abiding, living from this place of love. John the intimate was the one who wrote about this. And I believe the Lord is highlighting to us Focus on the intimacy John had and be like John the intimate. Don't just know the love of God. Be intimate with him. Be intimate with Jesus like John. Number three, John the lover. Turn to uh, 1 John 4.19. 1 John 4.19 John wrote, we love because he first loved us. I mean, you learn that when you're three in Sunday school. But it's profound. It is impossible to love God. It's impossible to love others. It's impossible to even love your own self without first experiencing God's love for you. Love flows out of his love for you. Love flows out of his love for you. If you don't know God's love for you, you are going to be limited by human love in the expression of that to others. And human love will define what love is by their own human standards and definitions. This is what I think love is. And therefore, I'm going to love you with human compassion and human love. Usually, if you look deep, deep down in that love, there's something rooted in self. What is self getting from that love? That's not the love of God. The love of God is a sacrificial love. The love of God is a selfless love. The love is a God-centered love that ultimately revolves back to God to glorify him. But John was writing, John, I believe 1 John chapter 4 is one of the most incredible chapters about love. And, and John was writing about that God is love, that if we don't know God, we, or if we don't love others, if we don't love God, then we don't know God because God himself is love. And how can you say you love God but hate your brother if, because God is love? I mean, it's, it's, it's simple. It's nothing complicated. But it actually runs really deep. It takes God to love God. We can't love God the way he, he wants us to love him without first experiencing his love for us. We can't love others without experiencing his love for us. It all flows out of that relationship. But John was the lover because John, and he wrote about this in John 15, he abided in the love of Christ. He, in other words, John lived from not just the life of God, he lived from the love of God. John knew inside of him so deep God's love, and he lived in that love, he experienced that love, and he lived from that love, and therefore he loved God and he loved others the way that God wanted to, him to them. Him, God wanted John to love them. As he didn't love with human compassion, he loved with the love of God. He loved with the love of God. And so 
the, the Father, in fact, John records this in John 17, 26, where when Jesus is praying, he says, Father, that the love with which you loved me might be in them and I in them. It was John who was sitting back recording that prayer of the Lord. And the, the other apostles didn't record it. John did because he was, it seemed as if almost he was closer in proximity because of his hunger and his thirst for the Lord. I want to be like John, not to say the others aren't great. They are. I want to be like John. I want to be so close to the Lord where I'm like, I'm like, I, I know what he's feeling. I know what he's thinking. John is recording one of the most incredible, incredible scriptures where Jesus is praying as his last his last prayer of his high priestly prayer before he goes to the cross. And he's saying, Father, the way you loved me in eternity past, may you raise up a bride that would experience your love for me and then respond with your love for me in the same way you love me. May they receive your love for them and love me with your love for me that we would love God, we would love Christ in the very way the Father has loved him in eternity past. And then John wrote about the new commandment. Uh, John, turn to John chapter 13, verse 34. John's writing and he says, or Jesus, he's recording what Jesus said. I mean, this is, Remarkable if you think about the 613 commandments of the Torah, of the law. And Jesus, as he's going to the cross in John 13, verse 34, he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Loving, loving other people cannot happen. And I'll say loving other people the way God wants us to love other people. It cannot happen if we haven't experienced the even as I have loved you. Because we will just give them something tainted with selfishness, something limited by human empathy or compassion. Not that that's bad, but God wants us to love others with the love of God. That's, that's what God wants. It, 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 there's, there, even as we approach the end of the age, there's this whole new definition of what love is. Love is love, and it's defined by whoever's eyes it's in defines love. And what I'm talking about, love is defined by God. God defines the standards, and he wants us to love by his standards, by his law, by his uh, requirements, what this is the definition of love, but he wants us to love not just with our own human love. He wants us to love with the love of God. He wants us to love with the love of God. And that only comes as we experience that love, as we abide in that love, as we live in that love. God wants us not just to experience his love one Sunday when we pray for you and say, God, let the love of God be experienced. So that's good. God wants us to live in that love 24-7. Okay, maybe some time for sleeping and other stuff. But, but God wants us to live in the place of love. Live from that place of love. God's love for me, God's love for others, God's love for God. And then we then love from that place of love. And so the, the, in the notes, if you want to check those out, there's a lot of other scripture references. But... I love the story that Jerome is a famous church father who died in 420 AD, but he was writing in his commentary talking about the apostle John, and he said that, that, that John came to Ephesus in his old age, and John was, he was so old that people had to carry him into the church service, and all he could, all he could, he could utter in his old age, you know, I mean, who knows how old he was, maybe in his 90s, I'm not sure, but all he could utter to them was, Beloved, my little children, love one another. And the people were like, Okay, John, we get it. You know, we, we, we get that. Yep. And he would say it every single time. My beloved, my little children, love one another. And the people were like, Okay, John, that's really good, but 
It's getting old, you know, Sunday after Sunday. Love one another. And they started complaining, like, John, can't you te teach us something more? Can't you teach us something else? And John said that, you know, supposing this is true, you never know. With, I mean, I think it's true, but, you know, you never know with their, some of this church history stuff. But this is what he wrote. He said, they said, uh, teacher, why do you always say this? And John said, because it is the Lord's commandment. And if it alone is kept, it is sufficient. Now, this is the one who had already written the book of Revelation, the deepest book in Scripture, that people have written numerous commentaries on this book throughout the ages, trying to understand, okay, what did this guy say? What did he mean by this? John, at the end of his life, was saying, little children, love one another. That simple, simple message. Let's turn to John, uh, 1 John 4, 16. 1 John 4, 16. I'm going to say this before I read the scripture. But the judgment seat of Christ, raise your hand if you're looking forward to the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, good, because I'm not either. Okay. That's probably the one event every single Christian is like, oh. <laughs> I just dread that day. You know, if anyone says, oh, I can't wait, I'm like, <laughs> I mean, everything you've ever done, thought, you know, believed is exposed and you're there laid bare before God. Yeah, I'm sure not many people are looking forward to the judgment seat of Christ. But I can actually give you a little bit of confidence based on what John said. And I, I think you could summarize it with this phrase, did you learn to love? The judgment seat of Christ is going to come down to, did I learn to love? I don't mean human love. I don't mean selfish love. Did you learn to love by and from the love of God? God, yourself, and others. Because everything else that we do that's not from the love of God and not motivated by the love of God, I believe is probably going to be burned. Not motivated by Christ, not motivated by the love of Christ, is not going to survive the judgment seat when his fiery eyes look down into us and judge us and reward us for the way we live. So I think it's probably wise to say, okay, that this is we're going to face the judgment seat of Christ. Why don't we figure out, okay, what do we need to do now to get our lives in order that now so that we don't suffer loss then. And John tells us here in verse 16, he says, we have come to know and have believed the love that God has for us. See, if we don't, if we don't know and have believed the love God has for us, we are going to, we're going to inevitably perform for God or we're going to strive to do things in the name of Jesus so we can gain significance from it because we don't feel love. And we gain love by people praising us, and we gain love by people saying, oh, that was a great word, that was a great message, and we feel good about ourselves, but all that's going to burn up. If it's not done for Christ, by Christ, it's going to burn up. So, John is saying here, we have come to know and have believed the love God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God. As we abide in this love, as we abide in God, we abide in this love and God abides in him. Now check this out, verse 17. By this, love is perfected with us. This is, this is going to shock you. This is what John's saying He's saying, by this, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Let 
Now, on the one hand, Paul says the judgment seat of Christ is going to be a terrifying, fearful thing, and that's true. On the other hand, is we can actually be confident when we stand before him. Now, I don't think it's going to be a confidence where we go in, you know, chest out like, you know, I'm it. You know, it's going to be more like, okay, I really, I'm afraid of this, Lord. I don't want to do this, Lord. But I think I live my life by love. Now, I'm still sure we're going to lose a million, not a million, we're going to lose quite a bit of rewards because of our motives and all that. But John's saying, by this, love is perfected with us. Knowing God's love, believing God's love, living in that place of love, it's not something you graduate to. You live in love. You never leave love. It's not like you go on to something deeper. No, this is it. God is love. Living in God means living in love. And if, as we live from this place of love, then his love is perfected in us, which means self-life and self-love is crucified and dealt with, so his love can flow out of us unhindered by self and sin. And John says, when that happens, you may have confidence in the day of judgment. Okay, Lord. Let us live from this love and be confident in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. Now look at verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We talked a lot about the, about the fear of God, fearing God and no one else. Well, John is telling us right here that the way to get rid of fear and anxiety is to know and experience and be rooted in the love of God. When we feel fear and we feel anxiety, now... You know, there, there's, there's some obvious things that would be natural for anyone to fear or feel that way. But when it's ruling our lives, it means love is not perfected in us. Now, that doesn't mean like, oh, God, I'm terrible. No, that means lo God, you need God's love. Experience God's love. There's no fear in love. Perfect love, God's perfect love, love drives away fear. See, as we head to the end times, the church, God wants to raise up a fearless church, a courageous church, a church that's unshakable, a church that's unmovable, a church that is rooted in Christ, who is the stability of our times. And for this to happen, we have got to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that it drives away fear. When you feel fear, you feel anxiety, it's a clear sign that you're not living from God's love. Again, that's not meant to be like you're terrible, you're evil, you're wicked, you hopeless hypocrite. That's more like, okay, it's, a, it's a, like on your dashboard when you're getting low on gas, it's telling you, oh, okay, I feel fear. I need to get refueled in the, in the love of God. I need to come back to that place of feeling his love for me because this, this fear is rising up. And so, j just to kind of move on here for, for time's sake, is John the lover. God wants the end time church to model, to be discipled by John through his writings so that we too could be not only the beloved, not only the intimate, but also the lover. The lover of God and the lover of one another. And then finally is John the Revelator. John, the one, John had the greatest revelation ever given to, an, to a prophet or an apostle. I think even greater than Paul, greater than Isaiah, greater than Daniel. John the Revelator was taken up to the throne of God and he saw, he saw heaven, he saw the Lord, he saw 
God's plan for the church, God's plan for the end of the age. He saw the, the judgments of God upon the ungodly. He saw the Antichrist rising up in his kingdom. He saw the, the coming of Jesus Christ in power and glory. He saw the millennial kingdom, a thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, when he rules over the entire earth. He saw the new heaven and the new earth. He saw the new Jerusalem coming down as a bride made ready for her bridegroom. He saw the eternal ages. He saw all of that. He saw more than any other prophet, I believe. And I believe it was because of his... His, his simple, pure lifestyle. I mean, John's life was really simple. Be loved by God. Be intimate with Christ. Love him back. Love others. And then as he did that, as the Lord's like, okay, I can trust him. I can trust my friend. And, you know, you know he said, it said to Peter, if I want John to remain until I come, what is that to you? That was also looking at John, who would write the book of Revelation. That John was going to live to write the book of Revelation, and it was written in 95 AD you know, when John was on the Isle of Patmos. And it was like the Lord saying, he is going to see my coming like no one has ever seen my coming, and he's going to communicate that. See, the Lord wants to give the end-time church Revelation. We need prophetic revelation. We need prophetic revelation of the times we live in. We need prophetic revelation of scriptures. We need, we need our eyes opened like John, and we need to know the God's end time plans. The church desperately needs revelation, especially as we see these things breaking out into the, into the world we live in today is we need that revelation. We need the revelation in the book of Revelation. That's why I was really in the last message saying God wants to bring the church into the book of Revelation because we need to really understand this book because I believe we're living in the times when these things are, going, are, are being fulfilled and will be fulfilled. We need revelation of these things. And so just to kind of uh, summarize or bring it to a close is, is I believe the Lord wants the, the church, God wants this church to study the writings of John and uh, specifically um, John 14 through 17 and 1 John and also the book of Revelation. And, and so, you know, one of the things we're going to do in our home groups starting in April is we're going to uh, folk, we're going we're to stop kind of the progression we were going and we're going to focus on John 14 through 17. We're going to focus on 1 John because I just believe God wants us, God, the Lord wants us to get equipped and discipled in the writings of John. I'm going to read a scripture here. Isaiah, Isaiah 40, verse 4. That as we do this, Isaiah 40, verse 4. I want to highlight this one phrase here. The Lord has given me the tongue of a disciple that I may know how to sustain the weary one with the word. He awakens me morning by morning. This is what I want to say. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. So just imagine for a second that you're living in the first century and John comes to your church I mean, just think about how incredible that would be to be discipled by John. And, you know, he, he's teaching all these great stuff. And, you know, being discipled by John. Well, we can actually be discipled by John right now. We don't have to have him come and disciple us. We've got 1 John. We've got the Gospel of John. We've got the book of Revelation. It's so what we're going to do in our home groups is we're going to really get discipled by John through his writings, John 14 through 17, 1 John. We're going to go through that. And so I just really want to encourage you to be one that would, that would really take this and be like, okay, we're not just reading this off to check it off our list and move on to something else. We're reading this as a group because we want to get the revelation John had, and I want that revelation in me. And you want that revelation in you. We want to learn from each other in our small groups so that through the writings of John, 
we can be discipled to be like John, John the Beloved, John the Intimate, John the Lover, and John the Revelator. And so as we bring this message to a close, I just want to encourage us to, to really see the Lord's heart in raising up John, that we could, we could look at his life. We're not trying to copy John and trying to imitate John. We're trying to say, okay, John is a model Okay, I'm going to be my own self with the Lord because the Lord wants us to be our own selves. But John was loved by God. He was intimate with God. He, knew, he loved with God's love. And John was one who had great revelation. I want to be like this. I'm going to model my life after him. And as we do that, I believe that God's going to bring the end time church into what the church needs to be in this hour through the ministry of John. And so I want, to, I want to close in prayer. I just want to pray for us right now that the Lord would... There's a, there's a need right now in the church for a fresh baptism of God's love. And I want to pray that. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray that. Just, just if, if, you want to, if you want that, just stand. I know we have people online as well watching. So even if you're online, if you want to stand and receive, and then, and then we're going to have some ministry after this. We won't do it online, but we'll do it here. But if, if you want to experience this baptism of love, and I would raise my hand, I, I, I need a new baptism of God's love. I definitely need a baptism of God's love. We need a baptism of God's love. Just, just receive right now. We're just going to trust the Lord that he's going to baptize us afresh in the love of God. Lord, we just pray right now, Lord, knowing that, that the, it is inadequate of anything I can do or anything we can do to experience your love. I'm praying, Father, the prayer of Ephesians 3. I'm praying, Lord, Song of Solomon 1, 2. Lord, would you kiss us with the kisses of your mouth? Lord, would you give us a revelation of the love of God that surpasses knowledge? Lord, would you cause us to be drawn into your heart, into your love in a much deeper, deeper way, Lord. Father, I am praying like Paul prayed in Ephesians 3, that, that everyone he, here with their hands raised, everyone watching online, Lord, that we would know and experience the love of Jesus Christ that surpasses knowledge. The length, the height, the width, the breadth of the love of Jesus Christ that surpasses knowledge that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Lord, would you baptize us in your love afresh? Lord, would you root us out? Would you root out rejection and transplant us out of the soil of rejection and, transpl and transplant us into, into the soil of your love, driving away fear, driving away rejection, driving away low self-esteem and an identity complex, driving away anxiety. Lord, would you drive and cast out fear by the love of God coming? Lord, would you root and ground us in the love of God right now that we might be filled and baptized afresh in the love of God never to leave that place, but to abide from love. Lord, would you do that baptism of love in our hearts, Lord? Lord, I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to, we're going to,